Good afternoon, and welcome to City Club of Portland Friday Forum. I am John Horvick, President of City Club, and I'd like to welcome members and guests alike. Those of you who join us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB Radio or watching on Portland Community Media. Today, Jason Bush and Tim Josie will talk about wave energy on the Oregon coast, but first, some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and our Friday Forum Spring Corporate Sponsors, Morell Inc., Northwest Natural, and Shrabi Williamson and Wyatt. We are grateful for your support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of them. Join us next week for a forum on Oregon Health Insurance Exchange and the following week, June 28th, for a discussion about DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, and what it means for marriage equality in Oregon. We are now taking applications to serve on the GED Research Study Committee and the Bike Advocacy Committee. You can learn more about club events, purchase tickets, find research and advocacy applications, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, City Club will be live tweeting this event. You can follow or mention us at PDX City Club, and be sure to use the hashtag City Club in your own tweets. We'll be having a Q&A session with Jason Bush and Tim Josie at the end of today's program. Members, please come to the microphone to ask your question. For all our audience members, please locate the index cards on the center of your tables and write your questions on them during the forum. We will collect them prior to the start of the Q&A. And now to our program. Oregon's public beaches are bountiful, and we love them. From fishing and sporting to tourism and natural resources, we can't get enough of our coastal views. With all the miles of coastline, we are uniquely positioned to continue our work as a leader in renewable energy from the sea. Earlier this year, the Land Conservation and Development Commission adopted the new Territorial Sea Plan for Oregon which specifies how and under what conditions wave energy projects can be developed along the Oregon coast. Jason Bush is executive director of the Oregon Wave Energy Trust, a nonprofit, public-private partnership funded by the Oregon Innovation Council to support the responsible development of wave energy in Oregon and the jobs the new industry will create. Prior to joining Oregon Wave Energy Trust, Bush was a principal at Sustainable Legal Solutions, where he provided legal services specializing in renewable energy startups and project development. Tim Josie is serving in his 15th year as Tillamook County Commissioner. He previously, previously served in the Oregon House of Representatives for eight years. In addition to his county duties, Josie is a member of the Oregon Land Conservation and Development Commission, chair of the Ter Ter Territorial Sea Plan Advisory Committee, and chair of the Council of Forest Land a forest trust land counties in Oregon. And so without further ado, please help me welcome today's panelists, Jason Bush and Tim Josie. very uh, comfortable setting. If uh, there was a bottle of Pinot Noir up here, I think we might spend the whole afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jason Bush. I'm the executive director of the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. Um, and uh, it is indeed uh, an honor to be here today to talk to, uh, to you about the state's efforts to promote the responsible development of ocean energy. Um, as when I was an attorney I worked downtown, I used to have the honor to come to your regular Friday forums and always enjoyed uh, these, these events. I found your speakers to be uh, fascinating, interesting, articulate. Uh, I hope that by virtue of my position relative to the microphone today that your standards have not changed over the years. Uh, so it, it, is, it is a pleasure. Uh, Tim and I would like to tell you a, a short story today about the development of ocean energy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting, fascinating story. We, we know how it began, we know where it's going, uh, but we haven't written the final chapters yet, so we can't tell you how this is going to end. There's still work to be done. I want to start at the beginning 
by simply describing what, what is ocean energy? Uh, why are we having a conversation about it? Um, ocean energy is simply a, a manner of deriving electricity from the ocean. From, uh, there are different ways to do that. You can uh, derive it from, from tidal resources. You can do it from ocean currents like the Gulf Stream. You can derive it from the differential between warm water on the surface and cold water uh, deep below. It's called ocean thermal exchange. Uh, and then there's wave energy, and wave energy is, is the, uh, the way that we want to uh, derive electricity from the ocean here in Oregon. We really don't have tidal or OTEC or, or ocean currents here. So uh, wave energy itself is very diverse. There are a variety of ways you can, you can uh, extract that energy and convert it to electricity. You could have a large device floating on the surface and in deep water that's uh, uh, moored to anchors. You could have a device that's uh, uh, sitting on the seabed and sitting in the nearshore environment, uh, and then everything in between. Uh, and they have wonderful names. There's the dragon and the snake and the power buoy 150, the manta ray, and they really are truly diverse. And we're a long way from settling on what we would consider to be the best technologies out there. And really, in fact, the question doesn't even make sense uh, because uh, there are different needs for ocean energy. Um, a, a project in Alaska uh, for, a, for a small village might look very different than uh, the type of technology you would use for a large industrial project somewhere, a utility scale project, or something that might happen, say, in the Caribbean. So there are many different technologies, and they're very much uh, still under development. Uh, so what you might want to use one place is dependent upon what the, what the purpose would be. The technologies itself uh, are, are still pre-commercial. Uh, we're still a few years away from uh, settling on uh, uh, commercial projects that are putting uh, power onto the grid at a price that can compete with, with today's prices. Um, and the, uh, the United Kingdom is really the home of ocean energy. Uh, they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars over the years. Uh, there are a lot of companies there that are both developing there and moving there in order to take advantage of the testing resources they have as well as uh, the significant price supports that they have for ocean energy. So the UK is really the leader and there are some commercial projects around the world, mostly in Europe, uh, mostly tidal, although there are a few wave projects. And we have a couple of wave projects in the United States, both of them are on the east coast currently. Uh, but Snohomish PUD up in uh, Puget Sound is developing a tidal project currently. So what is it about uh, Oregon that uh, sort of lent itself to developing this new technology? Um, it starts with the wave energy, of course. We have uh, amazing wave resources. In fact, we have the best waves in the continental United States. Um, but it's not just about the waves. If it was just about the waves, then uh, Alaska might be the place to do this because they have even better than, 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 the, than Oregon does. But it's not. Uh, there are other features that are important, including a grid infrastructure that, that can take the power. And in that way, Oregon is very lucky because we have a grid infrastructure that runs the entire length of the Oregon coast. It's all owned by Bonneville Power Administration. It starts in the, in the east, uh, as far east as, as Wyoming. Uh, stretches all the way across uh, Oregon and crosses the coast range and then runs down the coast down to Brookings. Um, and that provides an amazing opportunity to bring power onto the grid. We also happen to have the ability to manufacture these devices here. They're large, they're made out of, uh, of metal or composites. Uh, we have the ability to transport them, to deploy them and, and, and operate and maintain them. So Oregon is sort of uniquely positioned to take advantage of, this, of these, of these uh, opportunities that we have. Um, and that's where the Oregon Wave Energy Trust comes into play, OWET. Uh, OWET is a private nonprofit that's funded by the state of Oregon through something called the Oregon Innovation Council, Oregon Inc. Uh, Oregon Inc. itself is a collection of business leaders from around the state that come together uh, periodically on a volunteer basis. They're given a small budget by the state legislature. Uh, through uh, from uh, lottery dollars for economic development and uh, they're given the ability to look at various industry sectors that have the potential to grow in Oregon and they invest in those sectors in the hopes that we will uh, grow those new sectors that they will um, produce jobs good family wage jobs and that's really uh, at the end of the, the day what we're trying to do at OWET is create an industry that happens to produce electricity from the ocean, but also uh, in increases a, a, a per capita income with good family wage jobs from manufacturing and professional, uh, professional jobs associated with a, a large industrial process like, like energy generation. 
Uh, OWET itself has received about $10 million over the last uh, six years. Uh, we use that money in a variety of ways. We do uh, uh, outreach and education. Uh, we put on a conference annually. Uh, we, uh, we work with utility industries to help them understand how uh, ocean energy might be a benefit and uh, what might have value to be brought on, to be taken advantage of. Um, we, work, uh, uh, and, uh, we work in policy and regulatory environments as well. It's key. The territorial sea plan, which we'll talk about today some more, has been a key focus of OWED over the last several years. Uh, but most importantly, we work on research and development. Uh, providing grants to companies to attract them to come to Oregon. And in that role, we play a, we play a very close uh, a part with a, a great organization called NIMREC, the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center, uh, NIMREC, which is located at Oregon State University. And, and NIMREC is one of the three national test centers for ocean energy. And it's really emerged as the flagship uh, research center in the, in the United States. It's funded by the, the U.S. Department of Energy. So OWET and NIMREC work very closely together. Uh, to try to attract companies to Oregon, to, to provide funding uh, for them to come here and do, do, do work at uh, NIMREX facilities. They have shoreside facilities. They also have uh, in-water test sites. And we're building a new grid-connected test site called the Pacific Marine Energy Center, which will attract companies from, from around the world to Oregon for, for many, many years. But what is it about wave energy uh, that differentiates it from uh, other sources of renewables? Uh, like wind or solar. Uh, as I'm sure most of you are well aware, every form of energy has some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, some, of the, some of the renewables that have been brought on in the last few years, wind primarily, um, they're, they're unpredictable in short. Uh, the wind does not always blow, and it's hard to tell when Mother Nature is going to blow or not. Um, and that has added increased cost to integrating those intermittent sources of power onto the grid. Now, we've gotten better at doing that over the years, and the price has come down, but it's still an issue. Now, ocean energy has uh, the distinct advantage of being highly predictable. Uh, we know what the energy is going to be an hour out, and that hour out is the time frame that uh, planners, uh, grid operators, use uh, to plan to bring new resources onto the grid to, to meet the demands uh, that, that will be there in, in, a, in an hour away. So if you know exactly what that is, uh, then it's not very expensive to integrate that source onto the grid, and you don't have those extra costs associated with um, uh, sources that are not predictable. So that adds extra value to ocean energy. Uh, it also makes it look a lot like baseload generation. It's not baseload generation. It's not like coal or, or gas or even hydro, but it begins to look a lot like it, and that adds extra value to the, to the technology. Um, and also there's the fact that uh, wave energy development would happen on the west side of the state, obviously. Um, and that would help balance the grid. Currently all the generation, or almost all the generation, happens in the east, as far east as, as Wyoming. Um, by the time that power gets out to the west, uh, across the Cascade, and then all the way down to Brookings, you start running into problems. You, you can think of it as a long extension cord. And the further away you get away from the plug, the more problems you have with the quality of the power. And over the years, Bonneville Power Administration has, has made some major investments in that grid in order to improve the quality of the power. By bringing power on the west side, you would balance that grid and relieve some of those problems. In addition, it opens up the opportunity for providing power for new economic opportunities that might show up, like a uh, metals recycling facility or a, uh, a data center um, that would, would need fairly significant sources of power. Uh, they would either need to uh, produce power themselves, building some sort of fossil fuel facility, or run, run transmission across the Cascades. In, in either case, extraordinarily expensive and highly unlikely to happen. And so we miss opportunities, and those two I referenced uh, were missed opportunities out on the coast where we are in dire need of new economic opportunities. So I've given you a little bit of background there about why wave energy. Uh, there's certainly a, a lot I, I skipped over, but uh, it gives you some context. And I want to back up now to the beginning of our story, really, which is 2005. In 2005, the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, issued a study that identified Oregon as the single best place to do ocean energy in the United States. And as a result, a number of companies showed up in Oregon and started filing for federal permits to do projects. Now, I think that those, those early permits were premature. The technology simply wasn't there. But the companies were keen to identify good sites for ocean energy and, and stake a claim on them so that when they were ready, they could move forward. Uh, even, even the counties got involved. I think Tillamook filed some permits, and so did Lincoln County. And we now refer to that time as the gold rush. 
Um, and uh, it was a time when we realized that there, were, there was a great opportunity here, but we needed to back out a little bit and plan for this. And that's when Governor, then Governor Ted Kulongoski did two things. First, he entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC. And basically, the governor asked FERC uh, to delay issuing any more permits for ocean energy in Oregon until we completed the plan uh, for bringing those new sources of power on in, in the ocean. That's called the Territorial Sea Plan, and that's what Tim will talk about more in, 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 in a few moments. Um, but that, that memorandum of understanding essentially created uh, a moratorium on, on ocean energy. Uh, so when folks ask, well, you've been investing in ocean energy for the last six years and uh, trying to move it forward, but I don't see anything in the water. Well, for good reason, because we have a moratorium on ocean energy in Oregon, and we couldn't move forward if we wanted to. So that moratorium should be lifted soon. Uh, it's, uh, we have finished the Territorial Sea Plan. We have a plan. And it's just a matter of time before we lift that moratorium. The other thing that, that, that Governor Kulongoski did was he instructed uh, the state agencies to begin uh, developing the Territorial Sea Plan. Executive Order 08-07 instructed the Department of Land Conservation and Development to begin this process to add a new chapter, Part 5, to the Territorial Sea Plan, which is a set of policy documents that govern uh, how we develop things in the ocean. And we've been engaged in that process now for going on five years, and we finished in January with a rulemaking by, by Land Conservation and Development Commission. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tim, uh, who has been at the center of this process since the beginning. Uh, as the chair of the Territorial Sea Plan Advisory Committee and a member of LCDC, he has truly been the leader in this process and seen it from beginning to end. And I don't think that we would have had a successful outcome if it had not been for the amazing work that, that Tim put into this. So with that, Tim Josie. Thank you. When LCDC uh, embarks upon a rulemaking process, uh, the first thing that they do, if it's a substantive rule, they, uh, they appoint an advisory committee, and then one of the members of the commission chairs that committee. And so uh, being uh, the county commissioner that represents, or being a member of the commission that represents cities and counties and ports, uh, cities and counties, uh, all cities and counties, and then ports, and then living uh, on, along the coast, uh, it was my turn to step up and do this. And so, of course, I volunteered, and Richard Whitman, who was the director at the time, looked at me and he says, are you sure you want to do this? <clears throat> well, the answer is I had to. Uh, I just couldn't stand by and let somebody else on the commission do this job uh, uh, for me, it just wouldn't have felt right. But it was a very difficult process. And so I, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the difficulty of the process. And I want to start first with the fishermen that I represent up and down the Oregon coast, not just Tillamook County. Um, they have had a difficult time, as you can imagine. And I'll talk about that for a little bit. <clears throat> Uh, I remember when we were deliberating before the commission, one of the, the LCDC, one of the commissioners took me aside and he said, well, you know, aren't the fishermen exploiting the ocean resources anyway? And my answer to him was no. And, and But that was a very telling question. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about why I say no. But let me, let me first start by saying initially the answer was yes. Remember when COHO uh, was listed, uh, the numbers were going down, and the canary rockfish, uh, uh, which is this orange fish, that uh, were, uh, the numbers were getting down. And so there, there was a reason for this over-exploitation. And it started with the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which passed in 1976, and it was really uh, a document by the federal government that says exploit the ocean resources. And that's what happened. <clears throat> well, the, the document was amended in 1996 and then again in 2007. And it basically flipped it around and it says conserve fishery resources. So the fishery resources that the Magnuson-Stevenson Act is in control of is everything beyond the first three miles. The first three miles is the territorial sea plan. Everything else is called the OCS or outer continental shelf, 
when you think of the outer continental shelf, you actually, in your mind, you think about 150 miles where it drops off. Well, forget that image. It starts at three miles. And so there were vast amounts of fishing grounds that were no longer uh, allowed for fishing, uh, for trawling or anything out there because of the canary rockfish. There is a, a, there is a brand new generation of fishermen that don't even know where those fishing hotspots are anymore. It's a fully 75% of the historical fishing grounds have been lost. And so the fishermen um, <clears throat> experienced a huge uh, economic upheaval when that happened. The good news is, is that our fishery resources are very, very healthy today. Uh, the canary rockfish are coming back in leaps and bounds, and it's awfully hard for the fishermen not to catch those things. And then a coho salmon, if you've been reading articles, uh, they're, they're doing really well. Chinook, spring chinook uh, this year have been, the returns have been really healthy. And so that's the good news. Um, so then the next thing that came along uh, was uh, marine reserves. And so the fishermen who were saying there's no need for marine reserves because of the regulations that are out there that are protecting the resources. And so there were a couple of marine reserves that were put into place uh, by the Oregon legislature. And this was really uh, the, a product of, of uh, an environmental group uh, called Our Ocean that said, if you don't do this, we're going to go to the, through the initiative process and we're going to lock up a bunch of the ocean. And so the legislatures, they, they created two test sites and then they, then they created a process to look at three more sites and, and funded the process and, and I got involved in that process. Uh, I was uh, co-chair of, of one of the uh, three sites and then, uh, and then a member of one of the other ones. <clears throat> so uh, th th that process went through. The fishermen were feeling like uh, they were uh, losing incrementally losing more and more of their fishing grounds. Um, I oppose marine reserves, uh, marine, th these marine reserves, but I want to make clear that my thoughts about marine reserves are on the whole very positive. You go around the world uh, and, and the various oceans and, and you can see the impact, the positive impact that marine reserves have had. So when they're needed, they're really needed and it's a really valuable tool. I really question the need for the marine reserves that we finally put in place. They're not big enough to really have much of a difference. And so, but they, they are what they are and they're there. And so the legislature ended up, the next legislative session codifying these reserves. And then along came ocean energy. And so the fishermen, by this time, as you can imagine, uh, were uh, pretty darn cranky. Um, and, uh, and this is when I got dumped into this process to try to shepherd this thing through. And so it was a difficult process for, process for me because uh, I was representing the state of Oregon, but I also couldn't forget about my constituents. So it was very hard. So <clears throat> the, Jason mentioned the Territorial Sea Plan. The Territorial Sea Plan really regulates the first three miles. We had four parts of the Territorial Sea Plan. I won't go into it, but it really you know, regulates rocky reefs, ocean uh, shores, and that sort of thing. But there was nothing in there that talked about ocean uh, energy facilities. And so we added a new chapter, which we call Part 5. <clears throat> and um, so we, we started along that process. The next thing uh, that I want to talk about is, is a little bit about Goal 19. Now we have 19 goals uh, Oregon developed for our land use system, goals and guidelines, but they, in a lot of ways they act like laws. Uh, they're in administrative rules and overseen by the uh, Land Conservation and Development Commission. So goal 19 is, uh, I'll read just sort of the preamble. This is to conserve marine resources and ecological functions for the purpose of providing long-term ecological, economic, and social value and benefits to future generations. So um, as you can imagine, uh, there's lots of ambiguity there. And one of the things that, the, that Goal 19 says is thou shalt, I'm paraphrasing, so don't, don't, thou shalt protect fishing resources big and small. And so uh, when um, 
Marine Reserves came along, I was, I, you know, I took a literal reading of uh, Goal 19 and I said, well, you know, folks, we're going to be protected because Goal 19 protects us. Oh, I was wrong. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk more about that uh, uh, in, in a minute in terms of the different views on uh, uh, Goal 19. So uh, look, now I'll talk about the process that we went through. There were a, a number of players uh, that were involved. It was almost a four-year process. Uh, there was uh, the OPAC which, is OPAC, which is the Ocean Policy Advisory Council, of course, LCDC, and then the Territorial Sea Plan Committee, uh, which I chaired. And so we started in February 17, 2009, and we finished in January 24th, 24 of this year. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very, very difficult. Uh, the way it started was OPAC would have the first stab at it, and then um, and we, divide, we developed it into two phases. The first one was really the regulatory phase in, in terms of uh, who's in charge of what, what agencies do what permitting, uh, how are the local communities involved, and that sort of thing. And uh, so we, we finished the first phase uh, and then started the second phase, but I'm jumping ahead a, a, a little bit. Uh, so, <clears throat> so OPAC, they, they started the process and then they finished their work and then they sent it to LCDC and LCDC then created ter the Territorial Sea Plan Advisory Committee, which I chaired. And so then we reviewed their work and then when we were finished, we took it back to OPAC and then OPAC uh, uh, looked at our work and then it, then it came to, before the commission. And so the first phase was very complex, uh, took a lot of time, but not very controversial. Uh, and, um, and then when it went before the commission, I think we just changed two words. Uh, it was pretty easy, actually. The second phase was much, much, much more difficult because this is when we actually started mapping the resources. Uh, where are, are the rocky reefs? Where are the favorite fishing sites? How many of you folks are fishermen? Would you tell somebody, and somebody seeing you pulling a nice Chinook salmon, you know, you know, back to your car, and somebody says, where did you catch it? Are you going to be honest? <laughs> no. Well, me neither. And so the fishermen were, they, they, this is their bread and butter, this sort of information. They also knew that this process happened in California and there was an environmental organization, I think it was Ecotrust, uh, that was really charged and paid uh, uh, to gather this information from the fishermen and, and then, then word got out and all that information became public information. So when it came Oregon's turn, the fishermen were saying, no way, we're not gonna do this. So we spent a lot of time developing a, uh, a wall that protects uh, the fishermen from the Freedom of Information Act. And, and we finally got there, but it took a long time to get the f fishermen to divulge the information. And it started on the south coast and worked north. And the one county that really never, ever came clean was my county. Uh, <clears throat> they, uh, you know, Paul Hanneman, former legislator, and, the, you know, the Dorymen, uh, they were just death on this thing. And, and it, it just raised all kinds of hell as time, as time went by because we, we developed a plan around the information that uh, we had. And they were saying it's not good, it hurts us. And so that took a, that, that's another whole story. Uh, so, we ended up with 156 layers all together. It's called Oregon Marine Map. Uh, if, if you're savvy with a computer, you can grab that information and, and see what's out there. I think it's a really good tool. We set really a national, we created a national model uh, with Oregon Marine Map. <clears throat> so, uh, when the maps were finished, we, we, we finally get it all done, and so it's all supposed to fit together like this really nice puzzle, and we're done, right? Well, the problem is we weren't done because when we finished, we didn't have enough viable sites for Jason and for the energy folks. Uh, they need specific sites, and the sites that we identified uh, didn't cut it. And so this is when we had what I would call the come to Jesus meeting. And so I was before the Territorial Sea Plan Advisory Committee as the chair, and I says, folks, 
Kulingowski told us to start this process, come up with some viable sites. We didn't get there. And so I instructed Jason to go back to the drawing board, come back at the next meeting, and come up with some viable sites. He came back with 13 viable sites, and as you can imagine, all hell broke loose. And we tried to get this thing resolved, and I tried my negotiating skills several times, and I got handed my hat, and, and eventually Richard Whitman uh, jumped in, and Richard at, the time, at that time was working for the governor as his natural resource advisor, and, and he jumped in. And so uh, it, we ended up hiring a facilitator, and, uh, and we, we got the job done. But Richard took a more global view on goal 19. He says, Th these additional sites, whatever we come up with, fit the mandates of goal 19. DLCD staff, Department of Land Conservation staff, uh, took a different view, and they says, no, we're going to take a stricter look or a stricter view of uh, goal 19. We're finished. And so uh, guess who won? It was Richard, and so we started down the path. And so I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you, Tim. So the outcome of the territorial sea plan, is, is, there are two, two components. There are uh, written policies that are, that are part of Part 5, and then there are the, um, the maps that, that Tim referred to. Um, in those maps, uh, we essentially zone the ocean. And there are, I think, seven different types of zones, but they fall into three categories, yes, no, and maybe. The, the upshot from this is that if we had not created some, some adequate sites for ocean energy, we would have wasted our time. Kulangoski's original mandate was to find sites appropriate for ocean energy. Um, and that doesn't mean one site, because it wouldn't have passed the litmus test of, of demonstrating to the industry and to the rest of the country that Oregon was actually interested in having ocean energy. And so we worked very hard to ensure that we ended up with sites that worked for the industry, but that also minimized potential conflicts uh, with the, the ocean resources and, and its users. Um, we have four sites uh, that are, what I'd call, I'll call them um, development zones. Uh, there's Camp Rylea, uh, Nestucca, uh, Reedsport, and Lakeside. Four sites, about 23 square miles total. There are two uh, deep water sites in the south coast and two, uh, the two shallow sites are in the north coast. We also have these areas called RUMAs, uh, Resource Use and Management Areas, and those are the maybe areas. And they're intended to provide uh, flexibility for the plan so that if for any reason those other four sites don't work, that we have an option to develop in, the, in, the, in, these, in these RUMA areas. Um, it, it's, uh, the difference there, though, is significant. Uh, the development zones don't have a substantive standard for measuring your impact. Because we selected those sites because they were good for ocean energy and because they minimized conflict, we know that we can move a project forward there without any real potential for impacting important ecological resources like subtitle rocky reefs or kelp beds or impacting significant, uh, significantly impacting the fishing industry. So we can have essentially a lower standard for moving forward in those, in those development zones. But the yellow areas have, have a standard, uh, no significant adverse impact on these ecological uh, or other Goal 19 resources, fishing and other beneficial uses. Um, at the end of the day, the, the development of those four sites was key to the successful territorial sea plan. Uh, and I think that we can look at that, uh, the overall plan, and say that, that we succeeded. Uh, I can go out to the industry uh, nationally and internationally and uh, with, with my head high and earnestly and past the red face, say to them that Oregon is interested in developing ocean renewable energy. The regulatory language itself is very conservative. It's, it, it was designed that way. It's, it's very protective of the ocean and its resources, and that's the way it should be. Um, but when you add these development zones on top of that, you have a pathway forward for the industry. It's a clear regulatory pathway, and, and I think that folks believe that they'll be able to do a project here in, in, in Oregon. So it was very important that we, uh, that we got those sites, and that was really, at the end of the day, what, the, what all the fighting was about, uh, those, the, because that's where it got real. Um, uh, but I think we, we, we uh, found a good compromise for the state of Oregon. Uh, it was difficult. Uh, there was a lot of democracy going on. Uh, I think many of us had our fill. Uh, but we did it in true uh, uh, Oregon fashion. I think everyone had their chance to have their say and to, to have their, their concerns heard uh, and considered. And uh, at the end of the day, I don't think there were any real losers from this. 
Um, I'm sure there are folks who feel like they lost, but I think that what you'll see in a few years is that we will have ocean energy going on in the territorial sea and, and in the outer continental shelf as well, that the ocean will still be a beautiful place to visit, that uh, the fishing industry will still be profitable, um, and it will all happen together, truly a win-win situation. But that's a function of making good, smart decisions and setting up a thoughtful plan like we did in the territorial sea plan. Um, so I think it was good for Oregon, uh, difficult but good, and it's good for the industry. Uh, we're going to continue to develop. I think you add it all together like with the work we're doing with NIMREC and the test centers, the territorial sea plan, the state policies that support uh, ocean energy and OWET. Uh, I think we'll continue to develop uh, successfully here in Oregon. Um, but uh, what, what does the future look like? Um, well, we don't know yet. Uh, that those chapters have really have not been written. We'll, we'll write them together. Uh, if I had to predict, though, I think that ocean energy will be a, won't be a significant source of electricity for most people in this room, but it will be for your children. Uh, we are planning for the future, um, and that's the way it should be. Uh, difficult, uh, but, but that's, the, that's, that's the decisions that, that we need to make and, and, and the investments that we need to make. Uh, personally, I think that we've spent too much time investing in what I like to call caveman energy. Um, those are fossil fuel based, based electricity. Uh, it's a primitive way to make an electron move down a wire. We, we burn stuff in order to boil water, to create steam, to spin a generator, to move an electron down a wire. There are better ways to do this. Uh, we have sources that are endless, that are clean, safer, uh, from the wind, from the sun, from waves, uh, the heat of the earth, and from other resources that we haven't even thought of yet. And we won't think of them if we continue to focus on, on perpetuating the existing energy uh, systems and, and investing our, our, both our uh, financial resources and our mental resources, uh, perpetuating the existing energy paradigm. So I think it's time to re relegate caveman energy to the history books in like the 21st century, a transition period to move toward uh, cleaner, safer uh, 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 forms of energy generation. So, in summary, I can say that I, I'm, I'm certainly proud to be part of an organization that's doing, a, 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 albeit a, a relatively small part in this, in this larger conversation or, and effort. I'm also proud to be a citizen of, of a state that has the resolve to take on some of these, these tough issues directly. Um, they're not easy, and Tim and I's presentation today has glossed over a great deal of, of effort and controversy in this whole process. Um, but it certainly makes me happy to be a, be a citizen of, of Oregon and proud. And uh, also in our, in our efforts as a state to, to move humanity toward a, a clean energy future and to ensure that uh, future generations have the same uh, amazing opportunities that, that we had. And I think that's our ob obligation uh, to the future. I think Tim, Tim agrees with me there. Um, and, uh, and I really think not only is, is this uh, good public policy uh, to promote clean renewable energy. It, it creates jobs, uh, it improves our health, it, it, it uh, maintains the, the, uh, the health of the earth, um, but I think it also becomes uh, virtually a, a moral imperative to, uh, to the future. I think that it's a moral imperative by which uh, we will be judged uh, by posterity. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim for his final comments. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, is the, the fishermen themselves. Were they happy with the process? No, they weren't. And so I mentioned that OPAC in the process, when, when, when the Territorial Sea Plan or Test Pack finished our process, we shipped it back to OPAC. They came up with their own site recommendations. And, they, uh, uh, and, and then those recommendations went to LCDC and then the staff report, which was really written by the governor's office, came up with a different set of recommendations other than what OPAC came up with. And, um, and I, th I think there's a, a good argument that the OPAC recommendations uh, did not meet the litmus test in terms of uh, viable sites for the uh, wave energy uh, uh, industry, <clears throat> and uh, but OPAC, uh, or, but OPAC and uh, a number of the folks uh, in in along in the counties, the coastal counties, including my county, and not just the fishermen, but the people that don't want to lose their view shed and and don't 
want to uh, they want to protect their recreation uh, areas. Incidentally, those areas are protected. It's more of a viewshed issue, but uh, they they got entrenched and they had the impression that LCDC had to adopt OPAC's recommendations, and uh, and the commission didn't agree with that. I personally think that the commission was correct. Uh, the buck stops with us. Uh, we're the ones that uh, are charged with adopting, developing, and adopting administrative rules. And so there's the threat of litigation at this point in time uh, from uh, some of the more disgruntled members. I, I don't know if it's going to get filed. If it does, uh, I just don't see it going anywhere. Not being an attorney, uh, I can still analyze things, and I just don't see that this is going to go anywhere. So. <clears throat> Uh, moving along to the vein that Jason was talking about, was this good for Oregon? Did, was this a worthwhile process? Is this something that, uh, that I should have spent my time on? And, and the answer is an overwhelming yes. Uh, uh, wave energy emits no greenhouse gases. Uh, the Oregon coast uh, ha is one of the powerhouses in terms of potential uh, energy development. You know, we get strong waves coming in on a very continual basis, and you can forecast these things uh, out uh, 24 hours or, or longer in advance. They know when the waves are coming in, and so the, the power grid can really plan for it. Um, if we develop 15 percent of the nation's wave energy potential, we can, we can power uh, 25 million homes. That's a big deal. Um, <clears throat> however, right now it's it's just too expensive. It's uh, the cost is is 10 to 32 cents per kilowatt hour, and at, at my PUD bill, it's 6.7 cents per kilowatt hour. So it doesn't pencil out now. But that's not the point. The point is we're planning for the future because one of these days it will pencil out, and we're going to be ready. We'll have a plan in place. So. Are, are sacrifices necessary for Oregonians? Should we be doing this? Again, absolutely yes. <clears throat> I, because of the hydrocarbon usage that we have been using in the entire world and the effect that that's having on uh, global warming, and uh, I won't talk about that, but I will talk about ocean acidification, and I will talk about the neat, the neat tarts, uh, Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery in my uh, backyard. Uh, these folks, they actually grow shellfish larvae, and they've been doing it for a number of years, and then suddenly they ran into some problems. The larvae would be growing well, and then the next time they look at them, they're all dead couldn't figure out what was going on. And so they, they thought, first of all, that it was some sort of a bacteria. So they treated for the bacteria and they got Oregon State University involved and, and uh, the legislature dumped, dumped a bunch of money in uh, t for the research and lots of filtration and that sort of thing. And it, di it didn't make a difference. And finally they figured out it's acidification. And this time of year, when the winds change and push the onshore, the, the currents out, the upwelling starts. This is waters that start in the Gulf of Alaska and it takes 50 to 70 years to get here. And, if the, and every year, those waters get more acidic. And so this, these waters are very acidic and, and, as, and as time goes by, it's going to continually get worse. And so upwelling, increases the acidification. And so when these embryos or these larvae, uh, they reach a stage where they need to put a shell around them with calcium. So there's a fancy name for the type and I, I could read it, but who cares? Huh? <clears throat> the bottom line is, is that it, the acid dissolves that shell and they die. <clears throat> so this is a multi-million dollar industry that affects shellfish growers all across the world. And the, this Neatart's Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery is one of just a small handful of uh, hatcheries that provide this larvae. And so it's going to have a, an immediate impact, but 
that's nothing compared to what else is on the horizon. What about our clams? What about our crabs? What about our copepods, our creel? Are we starting to impact the very food chain of the ocean? And if that's the case, what have we done to ourselves? This is truly a dire, dire situation, and we need to do something about it right away. And so that's the reason why I was involved and feel very good about the work that we did, even though it makes just a small difference, it is important. I'm going to finish by just talking about the relationship that uh, I developed with Jason. Jason and I came at it from two different angles. His job was to do as he was charged. He was, he's funded by the Oregon legislature and is to get out there and develop energy facilities or programs uh, off the Oregon coast. Did a great job, and so when he's finished, the, my constituents go to our legislature and say, Jason did too good of a job, cut his funding, and so then he's in trouble. Well, uh, you know, he, he got funded at a lower level, and so he escaped it. So, but he's in a tough spot. I'm in a tough spot because I wear two hats. And, and the, the first hat, is, as I talk about, is, has been uh, representing the state of Oregon. Uh, the governor appointed me and, and confirmed by the Senate. And so I had to have the bigger hat on. I couldn't be provincial, but yet I had constituents that were very angry with me for not coming out very clearly uh, on, uh, early on and opposing uh, energy development off the Oregon coast. And so I think I escaped it, but there were times uh, I, I wondered whether uh, my political career was over. It was one of the most difficult things that I've been through in my life, uh, but I'm, I'm looking back on it now, I'm, I'm glad that Jason and I got a chance to work on this. Uh, I think what we did was we provided a great service for the people of Oregon, and more importantly, for our children and their children. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing this uniquely Oregon story and really showing our potential to lead the way for the world. And now if you have a written question in your index card, please hold it up high so City Club staff can collect it from you. We'll now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Before asking your question, identify yourself as a City Club member. Please only ask one question and ask your question as succinctly as possible. I will flash this question mark. Um, and if I do, please uh, wrap up your question. Thank you both. Jill Jocelyn, City Club member. I'm interested in what an implementation of this technology would look like. Jason, first from what an Oregonian might see, what might be required on land to get to these wave energy facilities, and Tim, how the fishermen might really be impacted by these areas and how they relate to the marine reserves that we have developed? So the, the visual impacts of ocean energy uh, run the gamut from invisible to in your face. The, the industry itself has no incentive to develop technology that is in your face because let's face it, at the end of the day, you, you really don't want to see energy generation. You just want to be able to turn your lights on and keep your beer cold. So uh, some of the devices uh, that would float on the surface that you would see um, would have a relatively low profile. Uh, they probably would have to have some sort of light on top of them for navigational purposes and safety purposes. Um, and they probably won't be closer than about two to three miles. From two to three miles, you can see them, but they certainly are not conspicuous. Maybe at night, if you had a series of them in a clear night, uh, I think they had those out on the coast, uh, you probably would be able to see, see the lights. Um, I think the long-term goal is to minimize that impact and to push development out as far as possible, both to avoid conflict with uh, the users of the territorial sea and, and to avoid uh, the view shed issues. But you have to start in the near shore environment as, uh, because of constrained resources, uh, but over time we hope to grow out. 
So, Jill, uh, the impact for the for the fishermen. Um, uh, I think I'll I'll, really, I'll start with the, the the crabbing industry. The crabbing industry, when they when they put out a crab pot, um, the the crab pot itself, of course, is is on the bottom, and then you have the buoy, the the rope, and the buoy, and it goes back and forth with the tides, and and then with storms, the pot itself will move. And um, so when you have a, um, uh, an energy facility that's out there, especially a facility that has a single moorage, it's, it's not locked in one place, it moves. And so it takes up a, a bigger area. And, uh, and so, and one of the ways you can fix that is to triangulate it so it doesn't move. But then that also, the triangulation takes a bigger area, so it it's it's difficult for the uh, crabbing industry to put pots anywhere near these things without the danger of their crab pots and their and equipment getting snared up. Uh, the other concern that uh, the trawling industry has is that if a facility is put out there, it has to be anchored, and what happens if the facility isn't viable? Uh, the, you you have to make sure that 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 cement anchoring facility is taken out because if you don't, um, it's going to, uh, they'll, they can literally lose thousands of dollars worth of gear. Um, so those, those are a couple of examples. Regarding uh, marine reserves, um, uh, you can't put a facility, uh, an energy facility uh, uh, up next to, a, or in or next to a marine reserve. It's just not allowed, okay? Kurt Wavering member. Um, my question has to do with what's the potential of uh, if all of these um, complex issues can be resolved in 20 or 30 years, what percent of the region's energy load can be ha uh, accomplished by uh, wave energy and what's your level of confidence in such an estimate? I heard 15% at one point. The potential energy from the ocean is astronomical, thousands of terawatts. How much of that is practically uh, recoverable is a very complex question, and I don't have all those answers. In 20 years, 20 or 30 years, um, I, I think that we could certainly achieve our goal of having at least 500 megawatts of generation off of the Oregon coast. Um, but to be, to be sure, this isn't just a story about Oregon. We want to develop the industry here, but in terms of creating electricity for Oregon, there's a limited need. We are, we are blessed with hydro already, um, and it covers the vast majority of, of, of our energy needs. Uh, it, the story is, is, is a global story. As we develop the technologies here and the experience and the sticky intellectual property from, from doing this work here, we can then turn around and export that knowledge, uh, the experience, and the equipment to the rest of the world, especially those developing countries that want to live like we do and will be uh, in need of a great deal of new energy generation. Uh, so really it's, it's, it starts here, but it expands to the rest of the world. Um, but we could service a lot of our load from ocean energy if we chose to do that. It's just a function of whether or not that's where we want to move as a society. One of the arguments that uh, I've heard some of my constituents say over and over again is, well, we don't need the energy here. Uh, what we would be doing is shipping uh, the electrons to California and, and wherever. And, um, I think what they really miss is that this is not Oregon-centric. This is about reducing carbon emissions uh, wherever. And so anytime we can produce uh, an electron that doesn't burn carbon, or, uh, I think we're benefiting everybody. Um, so. Ella Kelly, City Club member. Um, I think I heard you say that the leader in this form of energy was the United Kingdom, and I wondered if you could make some comments about things that you've learned from their experience. How far along are they with this? And also, is this being developed on the East Coast as well as on the West Coast here? Mm -hmm. 
the UK is certainly the leader. Uh, my team just returned from the UK uh, where they have extensive testing resources uh, in building uh, in a supply chain and around ocean energy, especially in the n northern uh, reaches of Scotland and a place called the Orkney Islands. Um, I heard a report recently that 3% of their population is working in ocean energy now. Um, that's a fairly significant number. That approaches how many people in Oregon work in the agriculture or the timber industry. So they are parlaying their experience in oil and natural gas in the, in the North Sea uh, into ocean energy, and they are clearly leading. We are definitely a fast follower, and that's a good place to be because we're not making the level of, of, of investment that, that, that they are making. Um, the, the East Coast uh, does not have particularly good wave resources. They do have good tidal resources and offshore wind. Uh, there is some wave resource uh, on the East Coast, and there are some companies that are developed there. Ocean Power Technologies, for example, is a New Jersey-based company, but that's the company that's busy here in Oregon. You probably know that there is a one project that's moving forward here. They, they got a, a, a permit prior to the state is, uh, implementing the moratorium, so they were able to move forward, and they built a buoy here. It's sitting out on the docks in Port of Portland, and they're working toward deploying that. We hope to see that happen sometime in the future. Uh, but uh, the West Coast is really the leader in, in, in wave energy. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, both the, the industry here in the United States and internationally recognizes Oregon's position. We'll take, a question. we'll take a question here from one of our index cards. This is directed to Jason, but it could be answered by either of you. What are the biggest remaining obstacles to the commercial development of ocean energy? Money. We need lots of money. Um, one of the problems with ocean energy is that we have bad timing. Uh, when we really began to take off, it was 2007. And guess what else happened in 2007? Uh, we have an economic downturn that has fundamentally altered the way that uh, the industry was able to develop. Uh, one of the biggest problems we've had is the failure of the venture capital uh, community to invest in ocean energy. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't really fit their, their, their system. Uh, we require relatively large capital investments up front with the long, uh, 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 long payback periods of, of a set amount. Um, sort of the inverse of what VCs are interested in with smaller immediate capital input and a sort of a quick quick exit. Uh, so we've not been in from that and we've benefited from the VC community. We've had to rely on the Department of Energy to help keep these early, early stage companies afloat long enough to begin attracting investors, which we are starting to do. And uh, I can say that, we're pleased to say that some sort of larger strategic partners are starting to buy up, buy up or join with uh, uh, these early stage companies, and that's a good sign for the industry. But money is the answer to that. I guess the other uh, concern is reliability. Um, it's just going to take some time to test these facilities and then uh, get the technology to the point where they can withstand a very, very angry ocean. Uh, one of the first facilities that was put out there, and Jason can talk more about this uh, and, and do a better job than I can, but it broke loose and sank. And so a number of the fishermen that I talk to say, you know, these guys don't know what they're doing. You're not going to be able to put something out there and expect it to last forever. Well, I don't believe that, but I, th but I do believe that it's going to take a lot of trial and error, which gets back to the money issue. He's referring to the Finavera uh, deployment, uh, which was a very early stage deployment. It was a test, and uh, they had completed their test, and uh, there was a malfunction. On the, I think a battery had gone dead, and uh, it began to sink, and eventually it, it did completely sink. And uh, um, so it was a failure. It was a black eye to the industry that we're, that we're, we're try still recovering from. But I can tell you that we are recovering. We're learning lessons from every failure. Uh, and um, we recognize that the, the technology must survive in one of the harshest environments in the world. But we can do this. It's, it's a technological challenge, but we can do it. Unfortunately, we have run out of broadcast time for further questions, and we'll have to stop for today. Please join us next week for discussion about the Oregon Health Insurance Exchange. And as we close, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to Jason Bush and Tim Josie.